Hey everybody, I hope you're having a fantastic TU day so far. My name is Florian, I work for Dynatrace, I'm based in Linz, Austria, and I want to share our lessons learned for what we call hyper growth made in Austria in the next about 20 minutes or so. All right, so where did it all start? So we started here in Linz in a beautiful office building. Actually, it was a private home with, a, with an old lady you know, cooking for us every day. And we started there not, be, not be because it was fun or somebody owned the place. We started there because, to be honest, it was cheap. And so uh, you hear the stories about Steve Jobs um, starting in a garage. So it may be similar, but you know, we're here in Austria, it's snowing in the winter, so a garage might be a little too cold here. So this is where Dynatree started uh, in around about 20, 2005. And one moment where I was totally blown away is when, when I saw at the uh, Times Square the big banner of the NASDAQ, uh, basically providing an update about some of our press releases that we have shared at a customer conference. So you stand there and you're like, oh my gosh, so I see Dynatrace up there. So that was, that was already quite unreal, but it became even more unreal when we were uh, joining the team in 2019 in New York City at the New York Stock Exchange. So you're there, you're downtown, you see this about a hundred year old building uh, that is, well, pretty large uh, and looks super nice. And then suddenly you see the banner coming down uh, with the company logo of, our, of your own company or of our own company. So that was absolutely fantastic. And then of course we, we did the IPO and from there on, I think uh, we, we, we can say the rest is history. Um, but what made us strong all the time, and these are the lessons learned, I think at the heart, Dynatrace is an agile product-led and software-led company. And the example here is how actually we have expanded over the last years in mid of Europe with our new R&D uh, locations, so with our new offices basically. So also there, we worked sprint by sprint, although a sprint was a little longer in the end uh, than two weeks. Um, but the interior design, we worked with the very same architecture firm that is actually based in Vienna, um, uh, not only for the labs here in Austria, also in Spain, in Barcelona, in Poland, Gdansk, uh, also in the US. So we have basically started with the version one of our, of our own identity uh, because buildings shape your identity quite a bit. Uh, we did that in Klagenfurt and Barcelona but then we expanded, we did, this, we did the V2 in Graz, uh, a V4 uh, basically in another lab here in Linz. And I think right now we are at version six or seven or maybe eight even by, uh, doing, uh, by having this uh, R&D headquarters here in Linz, Austria done. Um, but we don't stop, so we have another build out in Gdansk, another build out in Barcelona. But if you think about it, if you run a, a company like a software company, you can apply the agile, the agile methods basically everywhere, be it office buildings, be it recruiting, be it HR, be it obviously IT, um, or you know what about your office management team, what about your cafeteria, what about the restaurant? So so many things can be applied um, across the globe, and we're not across across the different functions uh, that that make us strong uh, as agile working teams. So another part of our success is simply a very broad customer base. Although we started first with a focus on financial uh, and insurance companies, I think very quickly we expanded by, uh, well, deprioritizing the use cases in these areas and focusing on others. Think about e-commerce, think about uh, the travel industry, uh, think about other software companies. So as Dynatrace is a software company, also many of our customers are software companies. Um, and so having a very broad industry and a broad customer base make, makes you very crisis resistant. So think about the epidemic we have right now or the financial crisis in 2008 and 9. So the broader your setup is, the broader your customer base is, um, of course, the more um, your business is resistant to any crisis that's going out there. And since our customers are usually also creating software themselves, you know, software is eating the world. Everybody's investing in mobile apps. Everybody's now doing virtual shows like we do this one today. So just the pandemic uh, created a boost. It accelerated many of the uh, developments that have been ongoing anyway, 
they're just now happening faster. So it feels like two years are compressed in a month or be it you know, five years are compressed in one year. But this is going on right now. And actually the two days and you know, thanks to the organizers here uh, doing, a, doing a great more modern virtual approach to running, to running the show. So just in custom example to make it, make it more real. So this is Eric uh, from Dish Networks. And they are one of the largest satellite TV providers in the US. And years ago, they have decided satellite TV is not going to grow. So they decided to become basically a streaming company. So Dish Networks is now de-investing in the regular satellite TV business, but using their infrastructure um, to deliver streaming value or streaming services to their customers. Um, at the same time, they are adopting everything that the cloud uh, can give them. So they are, with, with cloud, I mean, AWS, Microsoft Azure, or Google Cloud Platform, because they want to be quicker. They don't want to operate hardware themselves. And in the end, what made them really uh, buy Dynatrace was that simply uh, after the proof of concept, their teams came back and they said, hey, you know, when are we actually getting this thing, what, what, the Dynatrace thing, because I want to use it now. So it, it immediately was clear that Dynatrace provides a lot of value. And the value is actually uh, fundamentally based on the artificial intelligence that is uh, at the heart of Dynatrace. So what I see up here is the one and only product screenshot that I'll share with you. Um, but it illustrates really well what we're doing. So Dynatrace is making sure that software works perfectly. So in other words, we are helping our customers so they can deliver software to their customers in a flawless way. Flawless means it is performing well. Uh, the, you, you don't have to wait for the, for the button click on the mobile app. Uh, it also means that the user experience is fine. It's about capacity and cost planning and so many other aspects that are required. So we are not fixing the bugs. This is still in the end of the custom, uh, at the shoulder of our customers. But we are providing this topology model. We call it Smartscape. You see the machines, they are hosts, uh, virtual machines, containers. You see the network there. You see microservices there that are based on Java, Node.js, Go, or Python. So basically, you get a topology of everything that, that makes up your uh, software as a service business. And since we have all the topology, we can run a deterministic AI on top of the data, which actually means we can be precise, we can deliver answers and not just data, and we can offload many, many people out there to not do the daily grunt work job uh, they're in, but really provide value to their customers. And this is, this is the unique, unique value prop of the Dynatrace platform. So just to sum this up, um, well, we are headquartered in Boston, uh, which might be uh, a surprise, but it, back then it was much easier to get investors on board by being headquartered there. I think the investing industry has quite changed to the good in Europe, but I think there are still you know, many more things to do in the startup clusters in Vienna, in Upper Austria, in, in Styria, and other parts of the country. So although we are in total about 2,200 dino tracers, about 750 or so, uh, what we consider research and development R&D. And at Dynatrace, we, we truly have to do research and not just development as well, because we do many things as a word first. So many things are simply never, never have been done before. So we have to put the, the best talent and the, and the best uh, folks on the right projects. And so at the 750, I mean, it feels like a large team, but we definitely uh, have to grow further. And the reason to grow maybe to a 2,000 people strong R&D team within the next two, three, four years, really depends. Um, well, it depends on the, the right talent. So we are never uh, uh, focusing on the quantity, always about quality. So it's not just about having more people as being part of R&D, but we have to have the right people to be part of the team. Um, well, to get there from a 750 to a 2,000, uh, there are many lessons to be learned, but some of the lessons we have learned already or that are work in progress right now, I want to share with you. So, well, many, actually, I want to focus on three uh, macro themes. So before I go there, if you think about the organization um, of every team, of every company out there, of course, you have an informal structure. It's basically friends and family, folks you go out for a coffee with, where you have a beer, where you play uh, soccer or badminton with, and then you have a hierarchical structure. And many companies out there that are more thinking traditionally, they are focusing on, a, on this hierarchical, on the formal structure. So what is your job title? Where are you reporting into? What is your business unit? And all these kind of things, which 
we have found is actually very, very, the very wrong way to run a business. And if you think about hyper growth or hyper scale, this is totally in the way. So what we are embracing for quite some time now is a so-called value creation structure. So the question here is not about what is your job title or where are you reporting into, but the question is what is the goal, what is the outcome, what is the intent, what are you trying to achieve. And then if you know that, which also takes some time to write it down and to really think it through, then you ask yourself what is the right talent to get this done. And what you will often find when it's about customer value, it's truly not about just R&D or just creating a feature. It's about providing a proper go-to-market uh, on the website. You have to change the free trial workflow. You might have to do this and that. And so, so many people are involved. And you can't simply involve everybody, but you want to create a, uh, a sh for a short time, of, uh, for not forever, but for a certain time, be it three months or a year, a so-called value creation team with a, with a mission, with a goal, with talent and responsibilities um, that is totally uh, not related to the hierarchy. And this is what we do at Dynatrace basically every day uh, since multiple years. So in the end, if you are publicly traded like a Dynatrace after the IPO, I mean, of course you have to think about compliance. And of course, if it's about career development, you also have to think about uh, basically about continuity, about proper onboarding and about you know, basically running, running the whole company in a professional way. So I'm not saying that those things are not important, but usually there's so much time spent on the form structure and on compliance. Uh, and if you think about it, those two things are not creating value directly. So just a little pun here. Um, this is the link where I got or we, that we are using the book. For, so the book that you see on the link is being used uh, also to educate our team members where you talk about the informal structure, value creation structure. And the link here is from Talia, not from Amazon. Because also, also at Dynatrace, we are supporting local businesses that are paying their taxes. And, you know, so go, go there and grab the book. So who's creating value? And now think about it. Is the, is the hierarchical structure creating value or the informal one? No, it's always about the folks that are working on something, that are delivering value, that are thinking about the outcome. So in, a, in the, the best in-class organizations, or also for Dynatrace, the goal we are shooting for is ideally 80% of all of our of Dino Tracers are working in value creation team structures. Meaning it's not about the hierarchy, not about the job title, not, not about so many other things, but it's really focused on delivering customer value. And that's the only thing that matters. I mean, what I'm always saying is happiness matters too, because if you're not happy, if you're not motivated, well, how can you create something really valuable to a customer? So that's also not possible. Um, but if you think about it, it should not be, well, this is not my responsibility or am I allowed to do this? And so many things that are normal in, in bigger companies, they're really creating a lot of frustration um, and actually not creating customer value. So the three um, you know, larger, larger lessons learned that we have made. So one is for sure, and we overlooked this in the beginning, but it's about the purpose. So if you are starting and you are working for a company with a 20 or 40, team, 40 people, then everybody basically knows about you know, why are we doing this? Because it's sort of everybody knows. You don't know why, but everybody's in the same boat. When you're growing larger, somehow uh, this, this becomes something that you cannot, it's not simply working out for itself. So you have to think about the purpose, how to write it down. Also uh, push the teams to think about the purpose in their respective areas. So it's not a top down, these are your goals, uh, but the teams have to understand the intent and the purpose, and then you have to work on their own goals. So some funny things have been uh, coming out of that. So uh, one is uh, what, what I call the two beer rule. So if you write up something and then you give it to somebody and he drinks two beers, the person should still understand what has been written there. You know, you can exchange beer with wine and whatever you like, or maybe super strong uh, iced tea, that's fine too. Uh, but in the end, it's about com communication, keeping things simple. Don't, don't make it an abstract. So be honest. Don't fall into the management trap to say, well, everybody understands this. You have to talk to the, to every, to the indiv individuals. You have to get feedback. And in the end, you also have to, th to give the team time enough um, to think about those things. And this is why we give uh, a lot of opportunity to the teams, but also we time box it. So it's not about thinking and thinking and thinking, because in the end, uh, you have to deliver value. And this is what, what, what our salaries are paid for. So number two, 
of course, you know, everything is about the team and in this very little uh, uh, screen you see up there, um, this is a team of about 120 people that we have formed to address a new market about one and a half years ago. So, um, you know, out of discretion, um, you, you don't see the names up there, but there's uh, folks up there that have a product management background, a marketing background, an engineering background, an architectural background, also a tech support background and so on. Because if you're entering a new market, it's not business as usual. You, you really have to think it through. So setting up the right team, uh, it always hurts. Because getting the right team members means they have to stop doing something else. And everybody is, is busy and everybody is providing value. So there's nobody sitting, sitting around and waiting you know, for the next uh, item to work on. Um, so creating this team and making sure the right talent is there, the responsibilities are, are clear. I think this is something that we are still learning right now um, um, throughout the business, throughout all of the different stakeholders at Dynatrace. Uh, but it's absolutely amazing what, uh, what kind of opportunities you get there because it's not just about job titles and I'm a senior and you're not. So it's really about uh, you know, being a team, making sure the right, the right brains and the right talent works together. Well, and thirdly, it's something that is really hard um, to, to talk about in a way that is really meaningful. But if you think about uh, the talks you might hear everywhere else, it's about, yeah, make sure the culture is good. So what is a good culture? And the bigger your team is getting, you know, define the term culture. You have different cultural backgrounds. Uh, people are in the early stages of, your, of their career or, you know, at the university uh, and thinking about their career in the future. But then you are in your 40s, in your 50s. So it's really about creating a culture where the talent is, is being respected, where there is, you know, everybody is part of that. There is no BS going on, uh, like those management uh, half throughs that you might often hear. You know, work harder, and we believe in customer value first. So, I mean, that's all good and nice, but the culture is not done by a handful of people. The culture is what the majority uh, of, of the employees of every team um, well, are owning and shaping and driving, even if, even if they don't know that they do it. Uh, so in the end, uh, there, are, there is the need for role models, but not just a handful, but many. And you really have to think about uh, what are the guideposts. So what are the, the stakes in the ground you put in there um, for your team so that they know, you know where to operate in. Uh, and one of the guideposts I, I, by the way, talked about this is this value creation team and the value creating structure. So those are non-negotiable. So everybody has to follow that or at least think about it throughout. Um, but these are the guideposts we provide to the team. And of course, we are learning, we are ref rephrasing them. Uh, we get a lot of feedback. Um, you also need to take time for that. But in the end, the ultimate goal is to get from the around 750 or so R&D, really in a hyper growth, hyper scale approach to a 2000, not in a time frame of 10 years. This should be in a time frame of two years, three years, four years. I don't know, uh, but that's why we're creating new labs and we are not just hiring R&D, meaning software engineers. We are hiring across the board, architects, recruiters, employer branders. So we need the right talent. Um, and I think this is the, guy, the, the lesson learned for us. It's just not about R&D. It's really a, a big engine. It's, it's not about a family, but I think every successful company out there has to think about the customer value all day long uh, and not about other idiosyncrasies that, that, that you might see in other, in other companies. So I think the time is up. I want to thank everybody. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. I hope you, have, you can enjoy the two days. Um, uh, you enjoyed them already, but you also enjoyed the sessions afterwards. Um, again, I'm Florian. Maybe we see us at a different point in time again. Cheers, goodbye.